Hello, hello, and welcome to the PyChat Live. I'm joined this morning by Gary Palmer, Managing Director of Oxford International's Digital Institute, one of the great success stories of the pandemic. I am Nick Golding, Business Development Director of the Pi, and before we get into the conversation, allow me to explain the format of this session. We've got a 30 minute chat today with Gary. I'll spend the first 15 minutes or so asking him questions that uh, I've already prepared. And then for the second half, we'll throw it open to uh, the audience for your questions. Please therefore post your questions in uh, the box, ask a question below, and also feel free to join in the chat on the right hand side of the screen and I'll do my best to monitor that um, as we go along. Um, also, there will be a recording available almost immediately after we go off uh, air, and that'll be available at the same address um, on Crowdcast here. Anyway, enough already. Gary, let's get down to business. For the benefit of those who may be unfamiliar with it, please can you describe Oxford International's Digital Institute and, and what it actually does? Yes, certainly. So um, Digital Institute is Oxford International's online education division. Um, we deliver online education ranging across, I would probably bracket it into three different strands. So the first one I would say is sort of ranging from classic English language through to pre-sessional. So students doing general English courses, um, what we call English electives, so things like English for business, customer service, journalism, right through to um, longer term uh, courses around pre-sessional English. So courses designed purely to get students to a specific English language level to move on to higher education institutions. Um, we have our English language level test, um, our testing uh, section, which has been one of the big success stories for the division. Um, and that includes everything from the test itself through to um, booster courses, skill courses, preparation courses, um, uh, and everything that goes with it around the testing area. And then the third strand is our higher education. Um, so this is pre-masters, pre-PhD, um, launching our online uh, foundation program in January. Um, so longer term um, higher education courses, again, all designed for online delivery. Now, I, I've trailed this session with some pretty impressive numbers. Um, would you like to give us um, a, an overview of, um, of those numbers? And in particular, I think the breakdown as between um, teaching and learning and testing. Yes, certainly. So um, as of this date, I think we've now just gone past about 26,500 students that have come through the Digital Institute in some form. Um, about 75% of that is through the testing strand. Um, for obvious reasons, it's a, it's a mass product um, used by a lot of universities and, and partners now around the world. Um, the rest of it is then split between the pre-sessional courses and what we call our virtual classroom. Uh, so pre-sessional, we've probably now had about two and a half thousand students that have come through the pre-sessional courses um, and that includes our new blended course as well which i think i'll talk about a bit later wow um <clears throat> those are pretty impressive numbers and just remind me when did you when did you get started uh so the digital institute's been running uh since la the start of last uh, summer 2020 and um, we officially sort of launched it as a brand to market in november last year um but it had been running within Oxford international since the summer so just over a year and a year and three months now. So let me just understand that. Is this a pandemic innovation or does it have earlier origins? Yes, it's a very uh, topical question right now. Um, I think the great thing about the Digital Institute is it was it's really embedded in what we were doing before. Um, the, the, the original programs that we launched with, the language test, the pre-session English and the virtual classrooms, were all programs and courses that we were already offering internally. So these were things that have been designed by us for our own use academically. Um, and I think because of that, um, and not being initially designed in a commercial arena, they're very much, the backbone of them is very much based around the academic rigor and practical use at the end of the day. So when they did then go out to market and other universities started to work with us, I think that's why they've held up so well because they haven't been designed initially for that purpose. They were designed for use within a within a language and higher education environment. So we were probably doing online testing six, seven months before the pandemic struck as a way of helping us assess students coming into our own programs. Um, and likewise, online teaching, we were already doing that through our language school network as well. 
fascinating. And then, of course, the pandemic came um, uh, along and presumably turbocharged uh, everything at that, uh, yes. at that point. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned university partners. Are these simply um, Oxford International Education Group's pathway partners or are these other universities as well? No, not at all. I think we're now um, working with over 50 universities um, in different measures. Uh, Obviously, we start with our, our, our existing partners, um, but I think word spread quite quickly of some of the products that we had. Um, some universities we were having conversations with already, um, and they quickly started to use the services that we had. Other universities have approached us because students have gone to them with our various um, courses or testing certificates, um, or they've heard from our business development team about what we're doing. Um, it's grown quite organically, to be honest with you. I think with universities approaching us, um, it's helped us manage the growth quite well because we haven't had to go from zero to 25,000 in one month, um, which has been quite useful. Um, but I think what's really interesting is um, universities work with us in completely different ways. It's almost customized to every single partner. So we've got universities who just broadly accept our programs for entry and that's how they work with us. They just say, yep, it, it ticks all of our boxes. We'd accept your test for entry. We accept your pre-sessional for entry. We have some universities who have gone a step further um, and refer students to us directly because they want, they've got their face-to-face -face offering, they want to use our online as an alternative for students. And then we have some university partners who have taken the full suite in-house and said, you know, we'll use it as our own service, we'll white label it, um, because actually this is much more of an efficient way for us to offer these services to students. So um, it very much changes by partner, but I think that's been one of the exciting things and I think what's probably been quite attractive for universities is it's not a sort of one one size fits all type job. It's very much customised to what they need it for. And are we talking just UK universities here? Uh, no. So we had our first um, uh, European university um, in Milan, who now accept our pre-sessional and language testing. Um, and we are currently working with a number of US universities as well, who we're hoping to um, be announcing before Christmas. Wow. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> I guess the question then is, how much does does this cost? If, if I am a student and I want to use these services, what am I looking at? So, the language test itself, which is our um, lowest cost product, is eighty pounds per student, which I think you know in the testing sphere is actually a very reasonable price um, from a testing model. Um, the courses themselves range from anything from sort of low 1000 for our pre-sessional pre course up to four or five thousand pounds for the termly courses so the pre-masters the foundation programs um i think what's really important to note when you talk about pricing of online products is is very much um it doesn't differ that much from a face-to-face -face offering um because actually the academic backbone of it the live teaching components of it are the same if not more in some of the courses than a student would normally receive um, and I think that's what, that's what's important. It's the, the method of delivery and the access the students have is the key. Um, and obviously the students are saving in accommodation and travel costs and everything else that they normally have to pay out for. Um, but in terms of what they're getting, um, all of these courses at the moment are very much based around live teaching and taking that teaching to students um, wherever they are. It's not about um, making students do you know, fully asynchronous learning where they're just, they've just got to get through it on their own. There's no support for them. I think one of the nice things that we do get back from universities and from students directly is the the personal experience they get and the connection they have with their tutor. Um, the majority of these courses are daily live teaching of one, if not two, three hours, um, supplemented with another hour or two of self-guided learning. So you know, they're quite intense courses, um, but you are very much getting that tutor time, the live teaching. Um, so you know, from a pricing point of view, that's why those prices are you know, very similar to what you would see in a face-to-face -face environment. And, and that's a familiar story. I mean, we're hearing that from uh, a number of providers that, you know, one shouldn't underestimate the costs of setting up and, and delivering um, uh, online. Um, we've just had a question from uh, Chris Peacock, who's kind of um, asking a very similar question to the one I, I asked earlier, Gary. Headline numbers out of the 25,000 that um, have been enrolled, well, just over 25,000 have been enrolled so far. How many for tests? How many for teaching? Uh, so the 25,000 mark, it was just under 20,000 have been through the test and just over 5,000 have been coming through the, the other courses. 
Fabulous. Thanks for that. Now, <clears throat> the question that is dear to me anyway, and I, su I suspect um, everyone will be interested in this. Do you regard this phenomenal development as a COVID band-aid or as a portent of um, post-pandemic delivery and, the, you know, the way of things to come? Yeah, I think it's... Um... <laughs> I think the answer to that really is it's actually a, a bit of both to be honest with you there are some there are some areas of this which are a bit of a band-aid for for use um there's no point sitting here saying everything's going to just keep going um as things return to normal but for me that very much sits around the sort of general english component i think as i mentioned before the desire for short course study is still there particularly with junior language um and i think perhaps um going online was a real uh, a saviour for a lot of English language providers who could generate business during this time. But really, that industry is all about student mobility and getting students to do. Um, it's about the cultural experience just as much as the language component. I think the section that isn't going away and actually what we've seen is a new way of delivery and engagement with students is where it is a course for a specific purpose, whether it's pre-sessional, whether it's pre-masters, um, language proficiency testing, because what we're seeing there is actually students have have enjoyed engaging in a different way It's taken certain pressures off um if you consider with taking pre-sessional for a, just as an example it gives universities a longer recruitment window because they're not trying to get them in country by june july they can work with them on a course in country um they can still work with the student around bringing them in for september intakes or january intakes um the the student themselves are doing a pre-sessional because they've got to not many students choose to do it. They've been told it's a condition of entry. They've got to get their language level to a certain point. So they're not looking to travel and be involved in a massively, you know, culturally immersive experience. They want to get the job done. And if they can stay at home, if they can still work, if they can still study in their home country while have this course being delivered, that's an incredibly attractive proposition for a student. So I think that side of it is what we're seeing. And I think, I think one of the, I guess, the indicators for us is that the blended the blended version of the pre-sessional which we launched a year ago um has actually quadrupled in size for this year already um and these are courses where we're working with university partners to uh, run online pre-sessional during the week and then but to run weekend face-to-face -face teaching so it ticks all the boxes for the student of not messing with their daily life their studies their job um they get their online uk input but then we run in country sessions for them face-to-face where they can actually engage with the tutor, they can do, uh, I, I say, classwork that works better in a group environment. Um, but also the universities can actually have input, they can have um, admissions teams or sales teams come and meet with the students, uh, they can have input into the sessions and the types of content we're delivering to the students. And that mixture of live teaching together with the online components um, has probably been our strongest growth area going into the new year. Okay, if I may, Let's cut to the nitty gritty here in, in terms of autumn um, enrollment subscriptions, however you count them. If, if we sort of generalize and, and say we are coming out of the pandemic at the moment, how's it been over this autumn where, um, where circumstances are beginning to change? Well, I mean, our, the, the, the language test numbers are, are growing month on month. Um, we had our records. Um, record registrations actually last week um, where we've gone past uh, sort of 1500 student mark in one week of registrations which is a phenomenal level of growth um, within that product um, but critically I would also say that the pre-sessional courses and we are running four blended locations as well which we didn't do last year we only had one location last year running and um, this autumn we've got four of those running alongside um, I think at least 10 cohorts of online pre-sessional as well which is, as I said, four times as many students coming through the doors as we had last September, October. Wow, it, it sounds as if you're actually living, breathing and sleeping, the Digital Institute, having all of these uh, facts <laughs> yeah, at your disposal. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what I'd like to do now, Gary, I, 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 oh no, no, there's one more question I, I, I do want to ask before we um, open it up to the audience, um, but then we, we will come on to their um, uh, questions. Obviously, I don't expect you to give away um, business secrets here, but can you give us a flavour then of what's in train? Because you're clearly not winding it down. No, um, 
I think one of the big developments at the moment that we're working on, which um, isn't very sexy to talk about doing a webinar, but it's very much around the sort of back end of what we're doing for partners. Um, we, one of the selling points, I think, of a lot of the course we run, particularly the language testing, has been the sort of transparency that we can give to university partners um, and agencies who work with us around student enrollment, student completion rates, um, student results and verification. Um, it's been a big piece of the uh, security around the test, which has been obviously incredibly important. Um, but uh, making that more and more accessible for universities to be able to see what's going on with their students while they're with us. Um, at the moment, you know, we have account managers that look after them. We, we send out weekly reports to universities in terms of the activity that's going on. Um, but over the next sort of month or two, um, you know, we're looking to launch a much more uh, sophisticated back end to, to our testing and language portal. Um, which will give a lot more even further transparency to partners so not particularly amazing front-facing thing to be shouting about but a huge part of what we've i think the trust that we've built up with our university partners has been around that very transparent approach um and it's something that we want to continue and give them more and more access to so um in terms of new courses i'm um, coming out obviously that is also in development um but i think i'm just have to say watch this space in the new year for that one <laughs> fantastic and and this is just a hunch, but would I be right in thinking that there's more academic preparation um, pre preparation courses coming on, on stream? Yes, you could say that. <laughs> How very, very coy of you. <laughs> Gary, I've kind of hogged your time because I am so interested in this subject. But And I, I see we've already got six questions in the Ask a Question box, but I'm just going to have a look at um, um, the chat here and um, see what questions have been asked okay so Chris has asked um, where are the teachers based uh, so our teachers are mainly based um, between the UK and North America obviously we're very lucky that we have um, four language schools um, across North America um, so we have a very large pool of language teachers who work with us both full-time and seasonally um, we have more and more teachers who are based um, in Asia, which is really helping with time zones and particularly where we're now delivering sort of longer term courses, um, but primarily they are based in the UK. Wow. Okay, thanks for that. And um, <clears throat> Carl Robertson has asked, are the 20,000 language proficiently uh, test takers all taking uh, the test for entry to HE and FE or are they doing it for other purposes? Predominantly, yes, I would say the majority are. We are working more and more with um, uh, uh, sort of high schools and just for proof of English um, as a as a language proficiency test where a school is delivering it. But the majority of the, of the students that come through are taking it as language proficiency for entering to higher education. Fantastic. Now, we have got a very highly engaged audience here. Um, seven questions already in the Ask a Question, but one more from the, from the chat. Um, Christian asks, which are the, your um, main markets? Uh, it's mainly around uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia. I think that's broad enough, yeah. Nice and uh, to the point. <laughs> okay, right, mo moving into the uh, chat questions in the box. Our most upvoted one is just on the back of what you were saying, really. How do you ensure security and in particular secure proctored testing? Yeah, I mean, it's been obviously, I think it's been one of the big success stories around the test has been the confidence we've given to partners um, for the security of it. Um, the team here have done it, I have to say, it's been a phenomenal amount of work. That the team put in. I'm you know, very proud of how they've worked together and developed this over the last um, 18 months. Um, it's three strands to it, really. The first one is AI proctoring. We have some very advanced um, proctoring on the, on the exam itself around motion detection, sound detection, right through to the, the requirement to have the entire screen and computer shared with the portal the students doing the test. So we have all kinds of monitoring around windows popping up, typing, other access to the computer, what is going on, people in the room, um, and it will pick up all of these things as the student's going through that process. Um, the second strand to it is around ID verification. So students have to upload, obviously, a copy of their ID. Um, the exam itself will take a screenshot of the student at the start of each component they have to take. Um, those screenshots, along with their ID, are printed onto their certificate at the end. So at the end of the day, when they turn up to a university with their proof of English, 
and they're stood there with their certificates. There's a very simple process there of, did you take this test and is it you? Um, and the third part to that is probably the most unique to ours in terms of all of those checks that have just happened being pulled into one place, which is that we have a, the speaking is done with a live examiner. Um, but that live examiner has already been, had access to all the students' previous components. Uh, they've checked the ID themselves. They've checked the students' screenshots throughout the other three components, any red flags on the system. And then obviously going through, having been able to see their writing exam, their responses, the examiner will dig a lot deeper into those responses and the, and the students' understanding of what they were writing about. Um, and obviously it's the examiner at the end of the day who then asks them to show their ID once again with them on screen, ticks it off. So by the time that's all gone through the system, they've gone through the AI proctoring, they've gone through the ID verification, and then they've had that live examiner interaction. Um, we know it's very successful because we know it works because we catch students trying to cheat the system. We've had some very interesting uh, things happen. Um, you know, I think if I sat here saying we've caught no one because it works really well, that's a bit of a red flag to myself. Um, um, but I think, you know, all of those processes have given an enormous amount of confidence to our partners. And I think when you consider that, you know, as test centres reopen where students can go and take tests that are, you know, in test centres, this remains an incredibly powerful tool for students who are in rural locations, um, don't have access or can't easily access a test um, in a test centre. Um, and I think this is where we're seeing this continued growth with partners. It's not always about us being their core offering. Obviously, from myself and from Lil's point of view, we'd love it if we were the university's only test of choice, only pre-session offering. What I think we're seeing is that we are a very um, relevant supplementary service to universities. Um, you know, and that's a nice position to be in, that we've got these products there for universities to use. And like I said, with the test, even though other alternatives are available, this has very unique selling points. Um, and and I would say unique areas of use for universities where they probably don't have other options at the moment. You mentioned, uh, or, or rather you preempted my question actually about test centers and uh, home testing. Um, is, I know other providers are seeing massive growth in home testing and they think that that is set to continue for all kinds of reasons. Um, is that your view as well? Yes, definitely. I think, um, I think, you know, the nice thing with the number of partners we have now is that we have those conversations with them. They've got their reach into their international offices and sales teams. And it feels like it's very much a, a consistent message from all of our partners that this isn't going away. It's a requirement for students. It's helping sales teams and international offices to mobilize much faster and work with a much wider range of students. And I think as this continued demand for um, language proficiency continues to increase, you know, the more options that they have that are viable, the better. The security will remain the number one concern. And I think addressing those and the work that's going on behind the scenes, um, you, you have to have that confidence and that uh, from the partners. Um, but I, I think this is this is absolutely, this is going nowhere. This is a very successful product. Um, and like I said, for the reasons I've mentioned prior. Fantastic. And um, Hayley wants to know, uh, Gary, do your university partners contribute resources or costs? Uh, for the majority, no. Um, it's very much seen as a service that they provide. It's actually the other way around in terms of um, for partners who recognise our products, we give them a variety of discounts they can pass on to students um, to help them with their sort of student engagement with the with the with the test or the PSE products. Um, we do where we have some shared uh, models is around some of the more I would say intricately linked like blended courses because as you can imagine there are university contributions to that, but more from an academic point of view than a, than a financial one. Um, what we, we've seen more and more is academic teams engaging with our own academic team to customise the actual programmes themselves. I'll just give you a very quick example of how that works with one of our partners where it's actually, um, uh, they have closed cohorts, so it's their own exclusive course. Um, what they've done is they've taken various sessions throughout the pre-sessional course, so maybe two of the evenings that are online, and then they've actually inserted into that engagement with the university directly. So it might be somebody talking to students about what to expect when arriving at the university, somebody talking to students about accommodation or life in the UK. Um, we've done some where they've had live lectures, they've joined the university itself to actually sample what a lecture will be like. Um, and in that, obviously, the university is contributing the academic team to actually help provide materials and delivery. Um, and that seems to be more of the sort of collaboration that, we, that we're really enjoying. Fantastic. Thanks very much for that. And then <clears throat> um, really good question here from Joel Cutting. 
in addition to the impressive, impressive numbers, what are the indicators of quality of teaching, testing, content, etc.? Well, I think I think the uptake itself is probably a, a recommendation from the partners that, that it is working well and that the, and that, that academic background to it is so important. Um, you know, at the end of the day, when these courses are approved by a university partner, it's because they've looked at the academic assessment and the course itself. It's not about the commercial side. Um, as much as I'm sure many sales teams around the world would like it just to be about that, the university itself has got to has got to believe in it and what it's doing for the students. Because at the end of the day, the students are going to go to that partner and be on their undergraduate or postgraduate courses, and it's of no use to them to have be sending us 400 students for pre-sessional, of which only half of them are actually able to to actually access the course and stay there. Um, and I think what's given us the confidence in the courses is we're now into our second year, effectively, of these courses. And those partners are renewing, if not growing, their um, acceptance of our programmes or use of our programmes. Um, and that's because they've seen confidence within their own teams of, yes, the students we're receiving from you, you know, are being prepared very well. Um, we've had some really great feedback. And, and what's been great about this is it's come from the universities to say that the students are incredibly well prepared. And in some cases, more so than they would expect them to be, because so much more of our courses are around um, EAP study skills, um, beyond just sort of general English improvements, which I think sometimes pre-sessional can be too focused on because it's all very well getting their language level to X number, but if they're going on to a business and management course or an applied computing course or something, they've got to be able to actually um, have the study skills so they can cope with the with the study itself, um, not just being able to speak the language well. And I think that's something that we're preparing students very well for. And I think, as I said, the uptake and increased uptake from universities into our second year um, is sort of the, the sign that I've taken that that is going well. We're going to let you pause for breath in a, in a, in a second, Gary, but not quite yet. And interesting question here from Paul. Um, again, it's on the back of these numbers, but what were the biggest challenges in um, scaling over the last year, apart from lack of sleep? <laughs> um, well, I think managing growth is as challenging as you know managing problems. Really, it's uh, it's around making sure we can deliver the service to universities, um, you know, despite the number of parts that are growing. I think, as I said, we've been lucky that it's been a gradual increase in partners coming on board. Um, but I think most importantly, it's been it's been making sure that everything that we we provide the students with is consistent. So the student journey is so important to us that they have um, contacts they can talk to from a technical point of view. Um, they've got contacts they can talk to from an academic point of view. Um, and, you know, we do a lot of student feedback throughout all of the stages to make sure that that isn't dropping. Um, you know, we have a very high satisfaction rate of our courses, which is very pleasing. And that's a real uh, a measure for me to see, are we are we slipping in certain areas? Um, you know, the team work incredibly hard here and we've scaled up as we've gone to make sure that, that service level doesn't drop. Um, but it is the number one thing. I think if you're saying, you know, we are a supplementary service, we'll deliver the students, we'll make sure they're prepared and ready to come to a university or we'll get them to this language level. Um, we have to ensure that we are, you know, we're not letting the student down when they choose to come with us. Um, and that, that's the key for me. And I think that that was probably the biggest challenge initially was to make sure that as that growth happened, the students didn't feel like we're now part of a massive body of students. We still have that very much personalized journey going on. And I think that's really key of these customized courses that we're doing. It does allow us to really personalize the experience for the student. Fantastic. I think we've got time only for one more question. We've got a minute left. Um, and Martin Johnson wants to know, where are your face-to-face -face stroke blended PSE sessions delivered? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so they are delivered. Um, we did it in two countries last year. Um, this year, we're hopefully moving into two further countries. Um, we deliver them across uh, five cities. Um, so with this, we have a partner institution who hosts the session for us. So in terms of uh, the location for the students to go to. Um, so it's done in uh, effectively university settings or academic settings. Gary, fantastic. Um, <clears throat> let me see if we've got uh, any more questions. Uh, we've got just half a minute left. So let's see if we've got um, 
Right. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, you, we've talked about where most of your um, students are coming from, but do you see regional or national differences in the take up by students? Um, okay, this one's got to be quick. Yes. Um, to be honest with you, uh, not a, do you mean in terms of is it shifting or? No, I, I, I think, you know, do some uh, uh, countries' nationalities respond better to what you're offering than others? Is, is there more appetite for it in some countries than others? Uh, to be honest with you, no, not, not particularly. I think the, the, the courses are very broad. Um, the blended offering is incredibly attractive to um, you know, most of the countries we work with that have uh, sort of regional offices. It seems to be sort of the number one choice at the moment to look at that route. Um, but we're not seeing a particularly one country over another um, being the sort of primary driver for it. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. That, I am afraid, is all we have time for. It's been fascinating. It's been illuminating. Gary, I'm amazed um, that you uh, uh, haven't paused for breath. And I'm very grateful to you for telling us about your baby. And frankly, for being so candid about um, the numbers, etc. If naturally, if the audience would like to know more about Oxford International's uh, Digital Institute, then I assume that Gary will be very happy for you to contact him or indeed you can contact me and I'll put you in touch with Gary. If you've enjoyed this Pi Live chat, look out for three more sessions that we have scheduled with, uh, before Christmas. We have Phil Sherb from Cambridge Seminars College coming up, Abhishek Gupta from High School Moms and INACE in India, and then Ryan Trainer from Adventus. Meanwhile, from Gary and me, thank you very much for listening and see you again soon. Thank you.